The goals of the USEF and the FEI drug and medication programs are the same, uh, and that is a level playing field and our, our overall goal is horse welfare. Um, and that's our mantra and we repeat that. Now, what that means to different people, even within breeds and disciplines within USEF or uh, nationalities uh, and different groups within FEI is wide ranging. Um, and we'll talk about some of those differences. But above all, we want to take care of the horse and we want to focus on horse welfare. Um, and so the level playing field is what we keep talking about. Now, you know, it obviously in, in all, anytime you get into regulatory aspects of drug and medication, you get into who's responsible. And as soon as there's a drug positive, it's amazing how few people want to be responsible. <laughs> but right up until then, everybody wants to be responsible. But um, both these organizations do a little differently is in USEF, it has classically been the trainer. And then if there's a quibbling about who's the trainer, then uh, a hearing committee gets involved and determines that, who has care, custody, and control of the horse. In FEI, it has classically been the rider. Uh, now, of late, the new FEI rules broaden that responsibility, and they broaden it into grooms, they broaden it into veterinarians, they, they broaden it in a wider aspect because numerous of these people affect the care, custody, and control, even though only one person may actually have care, custody, and control. So there's a whole lot of reasons. You know, these, these are amazing equine athletes. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I get to work with them every day. And they go do these incredible things. And if you get a chance to drop by the World Equestrian Games this fall, you're going to see some incredible things. First time I ever saw a WEG uh, was at the Hague in the Netherlands, and I, I walked in, and I'd never even, I didn't know what vaulting was. I thought that these people were all jumping over a horse or something. And, and I walked in, and I saw vaulting for the first time, and I go, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And, um, you know, you, you can do the same thing. You walk in and you see a reining horse for the first time if you're not used to Western. I mean, it's incredible. So there's a lot of reasons these horses will need medication at various times in their career. And, again, during various times of their career, it becomes critical as to what medication is administered and when it's administered as well as their nutrition and feed because that can cause drug positives as well. So, you know, we, we know already that we cause ulcers by simply doing nothing more than uh, exercising the horse, stalling the horse up, and doing its job. So we cause that. That's a man-made creation uh, that we cause competing the horse. So there's a whole variety of other things that can happen as well. Um, Quite commonly, these horses come to a new stable environment. You put them in, everybody's cleaned the stall, you put down your new shavings or straw, and the first thing they do about 12 hours later is break out with hives. Uh, and that's pretty common among these competition horses because they're constantly moving around and reacting to whatever, whatever it is they're given. Um, so that's another reason. And, and, you know, I, I could go on with about a million pictures of hives at competition horses. Um, exertional rhabdomyolysis, tying up, is, again, a common thing. It can be because the horse is not conditioned properly, but again, when you start talking about these upper levels, that's uncommon. These horses have usually been pretty well conditioned to go do their job particularly when you get to the world-class levels. Uh, at the lower levels, it becomes much more variable. Um, and this is what their urine will look like, and this is particularly when we did uh, the classic or longer format eventing. This was a classic presentation for this in the 10-minute box. You'd stand the horse, they'd be splashing water on it, trying to get the heat down, and then you'd watch them walk away, and this is what you'd see 
is about the first three steps, they'd be very stiff and then they'd walk out of it. Now, you, you go ahead two hours later and then this is what their urine looks like. Um, so obviously that's something that will require treatment. These sort of problems, you know, these are the major examples of tendonitis that happen amongst a variety of different disciplines, but um, commonly also in the event horse. And, you know, soft tissue injuries are something we, we go to great lengths to stop. Um, USEF, um, you know, they, they'll jog some horses during some classes, other times the judges evaluate it. When you're talking FEI, remember FEI, equine athlete, is the single most scrutinized athlete in the world, okay? You guys let me know how many of the skiers you saw jog out in front of a group of judges at the Winter Olympics, because I missed that portion. Um, but, you know, it, it, these are very, very scrutinized athletes. Oftentimes we'll jog... Uh, I jogged when I was foreign veterinary delegate at Sydney, I jogged the jumpers three times. I got to where I knew them all. Um, and so, it, you know, you, you really, really look at these horses, and one of the things that you're looking for is a recent soft tissue injury. We don't want those horses to go on and compete with that. That is definitely one of the criteria that we're looking for that we won't allow going forward. Okay, so now we're back to USEF here for a second, and we're going to talk about medications that can be used, and I'll again briefly go through the USEF rules here, which will be a little different than the FEI. In the United States and Canada, um, it has been accepted that horses can compete on restricted levels of non-steroidals, and it's been that way for 30-odd years. Now, remember that Butte in Europe, in FEI, has been gone since about 1992, okay? And so, what, and we'll talk about this a little bit later as we talk about some of the, the recent changes in FEI, but when you get to the European versus the North American viewpoint on medication and the competing horse, there's now almost a 20-year divide going on. And the two groups are having real trouble talking to each other about it because their perspectives are so different. Is we've been doing it successfully here for a lot of years, so oftentimes when we talk about this in North America, we don't understand what all the fuss is about, okay? But in Europe, it's a completely different deal. They've been competing without that for a lot of years. So um, you tend to see oftentimes a fairly significant reaction when you talk about non-steroidals and competition. Okay? But USEF has done this for a long time. These are an example of medications that can be used at restricted levels. Okay? So there's only a positive if they're above the level. Okay? And there are some very practical guidelines that, and I'll give you a resource for that here at the end, um, that can be used in this. Okay, and in addition, there are other medications that as long as you stay within the practical dose guidelines and don't go above that, then you can also use dexamethasone for treating the hives that we saw. Uh, Prednisolone has to be withdrawn for at least a week. Methylpred, uh, another corticosteroid that's used in inarticular injections, at least two weeks. Betamethasone, a shorter acting inarticular corticosteroid, one week. And Vetalog, probably one of the more commonly used inarticular corticosteroids, at least a week. You have to declare that. Now, uh, again, major differences here between FEI and USEF. In USEF, what they're saying is, well, you can use it and you have to withdraw the horse for at least 24 hours and you have to declare it for a week. FEI is saying, actually, say we're talking about Vetalog here, FEI is saying, okay, when you show up at the competition, you better not have this drug in the system, okay? 
And so it's saying something completely differently when we talk about these medications. So we'll, we'll try to keep illustrating the differences between the two different systems. Um, and, and this is important, particularly where you all are focusing on nutrition and the importance of that in the competing horse, and it is a huge importance, particularly as you climb higher up the levels because the athletes become better and better and they're harder and harder to separate, okay? At the lower levels, it may be just the standout horse and it's gonna win everything and you could probably feed it uh, anything. It's gonna win it because it's such a standout from everything else. As you go up the levels, those groups get very close together and winning and losing is a pretty razor's edge. And so nutrition becomes critical. And um, so, you know, we've all, we've had examples in all the different regulatory programs over the years of uh, valerian positives from, um, in some cases, contaminated feed, in other cases from grazing on areas where they probably shouldn't have been grazing, and then also from people actually trying to feed this to the horses because valerian, as it was proven, actually causes a calming effect. And it's marketed in human medicine for that as well. So um, that's not something we want to see, and we actively try to discourage that. Um, and caffeine was one that uh, we've seen over the years. Um, USEF still calls caffeine positives every so often. Um, FEI has moved it to a monitoring substance. That is, they continue to watch it, but they're not calling positives on it currently. And then again, it depends upon whether or not it's there with theophylline in the correct ratios or incorrect ratios. And so there's, a, there's and racing differs slightly from this as well. So again, I'm concentrating on the sport horse version of drug and med and not the racehorse version. Um, and then, uh, you know, we had, we've had several cases. We had one where a supplement was being given uh, that had been brought in from Europe. Everyone was ooh and aahing about how it calmed the horses so well. And then we started seeing a whole lot of reserping positives. Well, as it turned out, the reason it worked so well is it had reserping in it. Um, you know, hey, that'll work. Um, and then we had another one where uh, a manufacturer was using a, a green tea. And this stuff, as it turned out, after USEF had multiple positives on it, they started going back and looking at what their supplier was giving them as they were putting their product together. And this particular green tea had sky high caffeine levels. So, you know. Uh, drinking green tea to calm down may not been the approach using that particular product. Um, so there's, there, in, in USEF, we can break it down into three categories. There's the forbidden substances, and they have the potential to affect performance. Restricted are the ones I just went through with you, uh, a variety of different substances that we restrict the level that they can be given at, and then permitted. The use is not regulated. You can use them as you like, okay? Um, an example of permitted are all the antibiotic agents except for procaine penicillin G, and that's because it, it carries procaine. Now, again, I've, I've been treating performance horses for the last 30 odd years, and before that I rode in my dad's truck and did it with him. And you know, he used procaine penicillin G. It's very effective against streptococcus and, and other bacteria. Nowadays, we hardly ever use it in performance horses because it causes muscle soreness. And that's obviously something to be avoided in performance horses. Um, all the antifungal agents, all the anthelminthic agents, all the newer antiprotozoal agents that you treat EPM with, uh, anti-ulcer medications are all permitted, and anti-parasitic agents are all permitted. Now, now the, the, 
I, I won't do the trick question, but I, I regularly beat up veterinarians with this particular slide because then I go, okay, now what on this does FEI not allow? And again, they allow all this. It's not a problem. All this is allowed as well under FEI rules. Um, you know, people have come to think the FEI has this onerous medication rule where in actuality there are a number of substances permitted in their rules. Okay, um, and then uh, USEF, all nutrients, minerals, electrolytes, fluid, um, and uh, again, most hormonal products used for therapeutic purposes, Regimate is the classic, um, and then again, these products must be legitimate therapeutic use. Now, Regimate is also permitted under FEI rules. You just have to fill out a form, and it's only permitted within the mayor. Uh, and there's been a fair, well, the, you'd, you'd be surprised. Uh, but there was a fairly famous case this year uh, involving a British jumper um, who will no doubt be here in the fall, um, and that they had a stallion that contained Regimate. Um, and again, it's progesterone, so it, it has a calming effect. Um, so... Forbidden substances, again, the, all these substances that might affect performance. And then this bottom category, if you've been listening to this, these talks on drug and medication, they always put this caveat in, okay, which is might affect testing. Now, you know, I graduated 30-odd years ago from undergraduate with a biochemistry degree, and, you know, state-of-the-art was thin-layer chromatography back then, and you got to sit around in your lab and watch it creep up, and it was really cool, and you were impressed. You know, nowadays they use triple-quad mass specs, liquid chromatography. I mean, the odds of anything affecting the testing at this stage of the game with the modern arsenal we have within the medication testing is about nil, okay? So it just doesn't matter really much anymore in regards to all the things we used to talk about. Now, the one thing that is a little interesting is Lasix is not allowed in sport horses, is in racing, obviously. And um, however, Lasix can be used in USEF by the, the testing vet to speed urination so you can collect the sample without standing there for three hours, okay? And while this seems like a huge dichotomy, it's actually not, because again, it used to be that it would dilute the urine to the degree that it would actually wash out some of these substances when we had less effective and accurate detection methods. Now our detection methods are so accurate, a little bit of dilution doesn't matter to us anymore. And if we need to know whether or not Lasix was used, well, that's easy. We use a specific gravity and look at that, and you can tell whether or not the horse is given Lasix just by the dilution factor in the urine. So there's some pretty simple methodology now that, that makes a lot of these problems in the past irrelevant. Okay, and what might affect performance? Um, all these. Uh, and and. You know, some of these are commonly used. Others, USEF takes a stance, as does FEI, that the psychotropic substances, of which this is a very limited list of them, um, should not be in a performance horse, okay? And the reason is because these are highly, highly unlevel playing field substances. If you can take, when, when I did... Pan American Championships, a foreign veterinary delegate a few years back. I, I went in the jumper compound, and probably the cheapest jumper in there was a million dollars. Okay? And if you take flufenazine and you give that, that four fault or, or eight fault jumper, the horse that's hitting just one or two rails, remember these horses can go make $100,000 every weekend. Okay? and you give them flufenazine, you take a four-fault horse and you turn him to a no-fault horse. Well, you just jacked his value up about a half million dollars. So these are hugely potential for abuse. 
And within the jumper community, there was some serious abuse going on at one time. And that has both in Europe and in the United States. And the good news is that the testing caught up with them and they don't do that anymore. And we catch them now. Um, so it, it, it is, a, I think, a testament to the regulatory programs that they don't let some of this abuse go on. Now, as you can imagine, it's constantly a, a um, you know, they get something new, we catch up to them. They get something newer, we catch up to them. So it, it never ends. Um, and then additional things are anabolic steroids and corticosteroids. So, um, and then there is this important thing within USEF to understand, and that is that you can use a forbidden substance legitimately to treat a horse. And, and you say, well, geez, that doesn't seem right. Well, actually it is right, is because if that horse colics, you, you know, you want to treat it, but just because you treated it doesn't mean it's there for the rest of the week. It can't show for the rest of the week. That, that's not logical by anybody's standard. So there's a method to do this and to use forbidden substances legitimately. And this is what it is. Three, three uses. Legitimate therapeutic use only. Must withdraw for 24 hours and must immediately file the medication form. Okay, so legitimate use means diagnosis or treatment has been rendered, uh, and it's a management of an existing or new injury, and it must not be so severe that the horse is unfit to compete. And again, the veterinarian, the ground jury, the technical delegate will have to take that on board and determine that. Um, and then non-therapeutic uses are not allowed and that's clipping, shipping, putting a horse on stall rest, training it, turning it out. None of those are allowed. So if you have to trank your horse to get it to the horse show, you've got a problem. And you probably need to train it a bit better to ship. You must withdraw for a minimum of 24 hours under USEF rules with the use of a forbidden medication and zero exceptions for this. Okay, and you have to file the medication report form. And, and this is very important under USEF and is one of the cornerstones of our program. And people, let's say they have an overage on Butte and they get a $750 fine. They don't file the medication report form and they get a $1,000 fine. And they're always shocked to find that out. It's just a piece of paper. I was going to do it. Well, it's the cornerstone of our program because if we have to depend upon no one filing these forms unless they know the drug and drug testers are there, well, it's not going to be a very effective program. Okay, we need these forms filed, and so we encourage our membership to do that by fining them significantly if they don't. Okay. And restricted substances, we've already talked about those. Those are the non-steroidals. Also, Robaxin, Asium, um, both are restricted substances. And then, of course, the approved non-steroidals that we've already talked about, which are, these are all the non-steroidals that are FDA approved within the United States. Okay, and these are the major ones that are approved around the world as well. Okay, and then... Um, toward the end here, I'll just throw in that if quarter horses are involved, their drug rule is very, very similar to USEF. They actually pattern their drug rule upon ours. When we make changes, they make changes. There are very few differences between the two. They're very similar. Um, and then also anabolic steroids are forbidden in the Arabians and AQHA and that's also clenbuterol. So um, one thing I'm going to back up to for a second is what's new in the USEF. And what's new in the USEF this year is these non-steroidals. And for what, since 1998, 
that was where we put restrictions on all these substances. You can't go higher than this, and you can't use more than two, okay? And now what we're doing this year is we have started, we are transitioning toward you can't use more than one, okay? And that's a change, and there are, there are disciplines within the USEF that found this a very distressing change. But again, uh, from our viewpoint, the Veterinary Committee of the USEF, this was seen as a horse welfare issue. But what it is, is that you can use two if you file a, a non-steroidal form where you list what you're using, the two that you're using. Can't use butanbanamine in combination, uh, but that's been a long-standing issue for the program. You can't use those two together because they have some synergistic activity together. But you could use two of the other, these other non-steroidals, as long as you fill a form out. Now, if you use one, you don't have to fill a form out, okay? And come December 1, 2011, it doesn't matter anymore. You can only use one, okay? So that's been our big change, this rule. And that, that may seem minor to some of you who don't follow the USEF, but it was actually about three years in the making. And without David O'Connor standing behind me, we'd have never gotten this one through. So we were, we were proud we got it done because I see it as a horse welfare issue. Now, FEI, there are some major differences here, and I'll just run through them quickly. Um, um, again, USEF, you can use non-steroidals. Obviously, FEI, you can't. Uh, medications during the show, USEF, again, you can use non-steroidals, so no problem. Um, FEI, few medications, and I'll talk about what they are, and you have to have a form for every one of them. And then um, USEF, forbidden medications during the show, never accept with the 24-hour withdrawal rule under FEI. That is totally dependent upon the permission of the veterinary delegate and the ground jury to use a forbidden medication during the competition. So if horse gets a laceration, under FEI, the veterinary delegate can go look at it, talk to the treating veterinarian and say, I will allow you to sew that up and I'll allow you to use four cc's of lidocaine to do that. And then they fill out a form and they have permission. Now understand USEF in this regard is actually more restrictive. USEF says, yes, you can use lidocaine and you can sew the horse up, but you've got to withdraw it for 24 hours. Okay, and then you can go forward. So some, some basic differences between the philosophy of the rules. Um, and again, um, USEF, multiple permitted medications, non-steroidals, methocarbol, dexamethasone, and you can use Article 411 or the 24-hour withdrawal. FEI, few permitted medications. Um, Gastric ulcer medications, antimicrobials, antiprotozoals, Regimate for mares. One, one new difference, and we'll talk about it in a second here. A uh, few medications at the time of competition, um, and you have to have permission. Okay, you have to fill out a form and get permission. And then emergency permission is through the veterinary delegate and ground jury. Okay, so uh, we, we talk about this, and this is... The FEI perspective is, okay, minor problems we can treat. You can treat, okay? You have to have permission, but you can treat. And there's a listing of them, and these are not uncommon things. One of the new things is down here at the bottom is that the joint restorative or preventative, however you want to look at it, the oral versions of this, the... Um, you know, HA, orally, or the um, uh, chondroitin sulfate glucosamine, those have been around for years and have been allowed for years orally. Not a problem there. What's new is that you can do it with a needle now, Legend, Adequan, and Pentasan. And that is simply since April 1, 2010, that you were able to do this. Again, it has to be with permission of the veterinary delegate 
They have to fill out a form. You have to fill out a form with them. It is witnessed by a steward, and they want to see you pop the top on the medication and draw it up in front of them. Uh, so there are several restrictions on it, but again, it, it's something that, you know, some of these horses go from horse show to horse show to horse show, and there's not much time to treat them. Uh, so this is, I think, a, a useful approach to it and a progressive one from FEI's standpoint. Um, so uh, their philosophy, again, very similar, welfare, level playing field, um, and they must compete on their merits. Um, and again, for the more significant medications, the interarticular corticosteroids, the non-steroidals, those more common medications that horses get, it's, it, it's imperative that they be out of the system in FEI, okay, before the horse competes. That's really important, okay? So just a real brief slide on showing you that the vast majority of positives in FEI testing would be non-steroidals, probably the most commonly used thing in sport horses, butte. Uh, and then you can go to, again, back when they were doing the, uh, again, they just now observe or monitor the caffeine theobromine and then isoxaprine still has positives associated with it, tranquilizers, corticosteroids, so pretty common uh, list of commonly used medications. Um, and again, the authorization, that's the emergency authorization that you have to get the permission for. Uh, for, and this is form, medication form one is what we've called it for years now, they're working at becoming more similar to the World Anti-Doping Association, which is the human version of drug and medication regulatory. So now it is an equine therapeutic use exemption form. So it's an E2E instead of a medication form one. I was just getting used to medication form one, so what do I know? Form two is for Regimate mares. So very simple and straightforward there. Um, and then for Form 3, this is the, um, again, legend, Adequan, Pentasan, fluids, antibiotics, uh, ulcer medication. Um, you can nebulize with saline. Um, we don't, as a rule of thumb, allow small volumes of fluids, I, I think, you guys all grasp that the horse's fluid volume is fairly large, so when a treating vet comes and says, I need to give a liter of fluids to the horse, I say, why don't you just squirt it in their ear? You know, either give 10 liters of fluids and, and rehydrate the horse, or 20 or 30, but, you know, if they're wanting to give a liter of fluids, they're wanting they're wanting a needle pathway into the horse, and I'm not going to authorize that for them. Um, elective testing, which is Form 4 in the FEI, is a new thing that has just started since uh, the Hong Kong Olympics, and it is you can ask for elective testing for common medication substances. So, if you had to inject a horse's joint fairly close before you put them on the plane and shipped them here to Lexington, um, and, and again, you know, we're going to have 550 horses shipping into Cincinnati Airport, okay, the largest airlift of horses that's ever been done in modern times. Um, and they're coming in there, and there's going to be that situation is, you know, a little bit before they got on a plane, some vet injected a joint, and now they want to know, is the substance they put in there clearing, okay? And that's okay. That's fair to tell them that, and that's what elective testing form four is about, a method to do that. And we're happy to help them. We don't want positives splashed all over the newspaper either, okay? And so if their horse is positive and they know that going on, they can withdraw it, okay? Uh, and they shouldn't have injected it so close. Um, 
and again, the FEI has a, has a really good list, and I'd encourage you to look at it sometime. Um, and uh, this is, again, in your notes, but if you want to write something down, this is worth writing, and that is feicleansport.org. Okay, and that is the site where FEI has put up all their new changes, and one of the cornerstones of it is this FEI list of detection times. And that is probably one of the more comprehensive, detailed, and accurate list of first use medications in the horse. Better than the AEP's list, better than UCF list, uh, better than anything racing has come up with. Um, and so this is a very accurate list. And if that substance is on that list, it has been harmonized in all of the five FEI laboratories worldwide. So it doesn't matter whether you get tested in Hong Kong, France, Britain, or Lexington. You can expect the same level. And we have a luxury in that regard in that in the United States, almost all sport horses are tested by one lab, and that's the USEF Drug and Medication Lab in Ithaca, New York, soon to be in Lexington after the WEG. Um, and that, that is a huge plus, and that's a difficulty racing has struggled with for years. They have 18 to 23 labs, and it's almost impossible to harmonize them. And so, you go race your horse in Nebraska, and it's completely different testing than when you race your horse in California or Kentucky, okay? And it's a real problem for racing, and they're really, really working hard and struggling to fix it, okay? But we've got a real luxury in sport horses because we've got the one lab that does everything in the Americas, okay, that's of a significant competition, and really, almost all breeds and disciplines, okay? Quarter horses test at the same place that event horses test at, okay? Um, and then we, that lab is one of only five labs worldwide that FEI uses to look at for testing on major championships. So FEI in that regard has a huge leap leg up on racing here because of this ability to do this. On the medicine box, one point I would make to you, a detection time is not the same as a withdrawal time, okay? A detection time means the FEI or the USEF has set a level, okay? And those are limits of detection, okay? And then it, it through a variety of work and research, then says, okay, here is the detection time this drug will probably go out to in the average horse. A withdrawal time is what a sports medicine veterinarian looks at the detection time, knows what this horse is undergoing, that it's shipping and it may be dehydrated, okay? And so then they give you a safety factor and that's a withdrawal time, okay? It's important. And, and the reason that safety factor exists because of individual variation. And there's not a lot of individual variation in horses, thank goodness, but there is some and it's largely because of the way we handle them, okay? Um, and then again, if, if, you go, if you get a chance to go to feicleansport.org, you'll see these various substances and these, it always surprises every time I give this talk to a group of veterinarians. They always go, no, no, I was positive lidocaine and mepivacaine or like eight days or something. And I go, no, it's still 48 hours. It's been that way ever since we put it in the box four years ago. Um, but there's a, a large amount of myth. I mean, there's probably as much myth surrounding drug and medication rules and withdrawal times as there ever was when you were being read, you know, fairy tales by your mom and dad. I mean, there's, I, I hear everything, and it's just amazing to me. I go, where'd you get that? Oh, I heard it, the guy down on the back shed row told it to me. He's positive, he's got the answer. 
So uh, again, there, there is accurate information here. You don't have to just listen to the gossip. Uh, again, one of the more common sedatives here, uh, xylazine, ramifidine, detomidine. Uh, again, if, and you know, having shipped team horses all over the world is one of my common treatments was before, if I had a fractious horse, I'd go ahead half hour before landing because I knew their ears were going to pop and I'd go give them a half cc or a cc of detomidine IM so I didn't have to crawl into the air stable at risk of life and limb and uh, I could give it to them from outside the air stable and then they just settle down while they landed and uh, their ears were popping and then you know they load the air stables onto the scissor lifts and lower them down, and those scissor lifts, 747, that scissor lift is up there a bit. I know because I've had to crawl up one one time. Um, and so, you know, you don't want that horse rocking that air stable while it's up there. You want those horses to be pretty calm. Now, a lot of these guys are veterans who have shipped all over the world, and they could care. You know, put them in an air stable, let them out, whatever. They'll go do their job. So uh, it does determine. Again, um, FEI has reworked both their medication code and their equine anti-doping code recently, and that is, again, on the website that I gave you. Um, and so pretty, pretty standard statements from there. Uh, one thing that is new is that uh, they do now require a medication logbook. Uh, be transported with the horse at a major championship and where a FEI tribunal may be invoked. And that would be the WEG. So what they can do there is that a horse gets a positive and the horse will be there probably competing during that time frame when that positive is reported. You can imagine that doesn't happen at the average horse show, but at the WEG it will because there'll be an accelerated testing protocol. And then um, there will be a positive, an FEI tribunal will be invoked, and they will first thing they will do is say, we want to see the horse's medication log. Okay, we want to know what you've been doing to it, and if that correlates with what you say you've been doing to it and with what we see in the horse. And then uh, again, and there's, you know, as you guys are probably grasping, uh, and why Joe was over talking to the chef de mission meeting is that, you know, what these horses ingest is a part of it. So those substances that are being fed to these horses are also subjected to testing. So we know what they're going to ingest and that there's not valerian in the hay or something weird. And, and Joe and I have done this at various places around the world enough that everybody's pretty used to the deal now. And, but the competitors count on that because, I mean, it, it's pretty bad. If you go, you ship your horse across the world, you go win the competition, and, and you have a positive medication control for any variety of reasons. I mean, that's a pretty sad way to lose a medal. Um, so we try to avoid that. Again, all these things are considered any time a horse gets medicated, um, and, and again, team vets, and there'll be a lot of team veterinarians here doing this, treating these horses, um, and they have questions, and we do our best to answer them for them. Um, again, we talked about this. Um, one point I would make, and, and while this is an uncommon situation, there is evidence of recycling. And that recycling means that, say, a horse bedded on straw can be given a medication, excrete the medication in the urine, and then if it eats the urine-soaked straw, it can then recycle the medication back into it. Now, it's at a fairly low level. And actually, the, the study that proved this, I thought, you know, they did a lot of things that will never happen to a show horse, okay? Um, and the horses were encouraged to eat their own bedding. 
so show horses, I mean, these grooms are in those stalls about 20 times a day. So it, it's, it's very unlikely, but it does happen. And the horseman advice here is make sure when you go into a new area that you clean it well, okay? And that preferably you bet on sawdust. Uh, last thing I'd leave you with is uh, Dr. Steve Schumacher is the staff veterinarian for USEF Drug and Medication. And uh, all the USEF rules are at USEF.org. Steve Schumacher's address, is, uh, email is there. And then uh, Dr. Graham Cook uh, is the uh, head of the veterinary department for FEI. And again, uh, horsesport.org or feicleansport.org. So that's what I have for you.